On the Experts Connect podcast, we have thought-provoking conversations with top-performing experts on topics that matter to you. With Experts Connect, you'll uncover fascinating facts and gain the necessary skills you'll need to improve all aspects of your life. Today, we'll be talking to Mr. Khaled Fatal. Khaled Fatal is the founder and chairman of the MLI Group, whose motto is Cybersecurity is no longer the keyword, survivability in a geopoly cyber threatened world is. Fatal has been involved in the global infrastructure of the internet, its resiliency, stability, and security since the mid 90s. He championed, led, and contributed to making it the multilingual internet it is today through international institutions and forums such as the United Nations, ITU, ICANN, UN, IGF, and many others. Khaled is frequently invited to keynote, speak, and chair public and private expos, international conferences, and events interviewed on radio and TV, and writes regularly for online and print cyber, internet, political, cyber, and defense publications. He holds a BS in Business Administration from the University of South California, 1984, and an MBA from California State University at Los Angeles, 1987. Khaled will be talking to us today about survivability in an unprecedented era. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm good. You're welcome. So Khaled, one of the slogans of the MLI group is cybersecurity is no longer the keyword. Survivability in a geopoly cyber threatened world is. Can you explain with examples the notion of geopoly cyber warfare? You know, um, uh, we get that question so many times. And um, just to give you a brief background, uh, in 2012, we were conducting a major study of the internet usability in the Arabic script regions. And, um, and I'll make it very brief, but basically we wanted to find out what were the common services we can offer to multiple communities, which were about maybe 300 million users that use the Arabic script around the world. That's Arabic, Urdu, Farsi. And, um, and we did surveys uh, in multiple languages. We did uh, events, um, seminars. I actually conducted seminars in many capitals around uh, many of these countries. And... Um, the 80% of the answers we already knew in advance. And I was looking for that 20%. And this 20% is what shocked me. We discovered the early days of the ISIS destruction motivation through cyber, long before anyone around the world heard about ISIS going into, uh, into Iraq in 2013 and occupying a third of the country in less than a week or 10 days. So we decided Creating uh, uh, solutions to these threats is key because stakeholders all over the world are going to be impacted, including corporate, including governments, because the most of them were still following uh, cybersecurity strategies and solutions that were predominantly aimed at mitigating financial motivation. So geopoly cyber, by definition, is religious extremist, uh, ideological, uh, and other non-financial motivation to hack an organization or a government. And basically, as you've seen the last few years, and especially recently, they are the geopolitical motivations when you hack a country to coerce, or you, you hack a government or a major organization to coerce it to take a new political or economic direction that is not in their best interest. So the day when you get a cyber attack and you get a ransomware is the day you go and pray because you think, oh my God, I know what they want. 
Yeah. With Jimmy Cyber, the motivation is not financial. The motivation is perhaps bringing your nation state down to its knees or your organization. And there have been numerous examples. Even recently, you have examples where hacks have been labeled as either unfinancial, but they, because they could not see anything being sold on the dark web, or they call it a nation state behind it. Well, it's called geopoly cyber. Yeah. And unless you identify the threat, you have no chance of mitigating. And that's why we talk about the resilience, cybersecurity, uh, strategies, solutions, resiliency, continuity, have no means of mitigating these threats because they are using the format of uh, defending a fortress. And guess what? There hasn't been a single fortress in the last 2000 years that's still standing. So fortresses are meant to be breached. So how do you mitigate once you are breached? This is where we come in. Yeah, now that we're talking about resilience, why do we need survivability? That's a very good question as well. Uh, the way we, we actually uh, uh, implement our solutions is, is not aimed at uh, mid-management or the marketing department. It's really, it's, it starts with uh, uh, briefings to chairman, CEOs, or boards, or top government officials. They are in charge of the strategic direction of the organization or of their the nation state. And quite often, they're not experts in either cyber or in, in many, you know, they're politicians. Yeah. And the problem here is virtually with little exception, some exceptions are starting now, but all around the world, you have very little exceptions of many of them doing something different because the vendors, the cybersecurity vendors and the strategies continue to call things cybersecurity solutions, cyber, you know, but the problem here is those solutions have been proven to fail year in, year after year and major go uh, governments and major, major corporations are getting breached and there's no, they have no solutions for them. And that's because from it, they're using technology to defend the fortress. And we all know technology has vulnerabilities. Yeah. The problem here is the minute you get into the motivation of the perpetrators, you have to understand that an extremist has no opportunity cost to their time. So in principle, cybersecurity strategy, uh, solutions are all devised to make it difficult for you to, uh, uh, to get rewarded for your attack and then go somewhere else because it's easier because you make your money there. Well, what do you do when a, a hacker has no opportunity cost to their time? They're motivated by an ideology or a philosophy or a, a, a false religion. Yeah. It's what? That's why they fail. Big example, big, big example. Recently, we, in tw late 2020, uh, 2020, we heard of the, the brain of the global empire was breached. The communications of the White House was hacked. Yeah. And guess what? America and the United States has more brains, more money than God. So if you can't have, if, if they can be breached and the brain of the empire can be breached, what are your chances? That's because they still follow the same antiquated strategies because if you want to call it the special interest, the vendors, they're all in, they're making money, why change? And you know, the, the approval from governments is based on cybersecurity services. Oh yeah, yeah, we can add this one, add this one, and add this one. Uh, numerous examples. Uh, look at the solar winds hack. 18,000 vendors, uh, uh, clients, many of them are, are uh, critical national infrastructure, uh, 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 other sectors, government installations. It proves the point. So. The key here is if you keep following cybersecurity strategies, resiliency and continuity, you are missing key components in a formula that will help you not only better mitigate your fortress, but also being able to effectively survive after the breach. And that's key. And by the way, those who say, well, governments you know, will always survive, well, governments also compete. Governments compete against other governments for jobs, for tourism, for uh, you name it. Guess what? A government that implements better strategies that help elevate its nation's posture, 
against these threats is far more likely to receive uh, investments than some some other country that isn't. So that explains that. I hope that explains the 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 uh, uh, the the, 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 the the differences and the and the philosophies and the solutions behind it as well. Okay, so um, it does. But what's the key difference of survivability? Let me give you an example. Um, very good question. When you look at recent events since, let's say, 2016, since the election in the United States being claimed to have been hacked by a foreign nation, mm -hmm. um, prior to that, most people did not understand that you know, uh, the threat from geopolitics is a concern. And they don't think it matters to them. You know, I mean, as a citizen, you know, I go shopping in the morning, I come back from work, you know, how am I? Well, the truth of the matter here is these, the, 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 the scale, the impact, the magnitude of breaches that are geopolitical motivated are far, far more devastating on a nation, on an organization, on people, on their lives and livelihoods than a financially motivated one. They may not necessarily happen on daily basis the way we hear them in the press. In fact, there are many breaches that do take place, but they're not, they don't get um, uh, publicized for security, national security reasons. Yeah. So the truth is that this is a difference, a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a seismic difference. So it's no longer pay the ransom and let's move on or don't intro, oh, we got hacked. Um, don't interrupt the CEO. He's on the 18th hole playing his golf game. Pay the ransom. No, uh, there are numerous examples. I've just given you examples of the US government being hacked. There, are, there is really not a single government around the world that has not been hacked or compromised by geopoly cyber in the last couple of years. There isn't. So unless you figure, unless you, if you don't know how to name the threat, you have no chance of mitigating the threat. Yeah. Starts with understanding that as long as you keep calling the threat cybersecurity breach, guess what? You're still saying that the solution is technology. Technology is key. Technology is critical. Uh, cybersecurity is also critical as a component of survivability, but alone, it cannot mitigate the threats to the nation state or to the organization or people's lives and livelihoods. And as, and one last point, as a leader, as a national leader, it is your responsibility to protect your citizen and your nation. Yeah. So unless you are implementing uh, uh, solutions that can do that, guess what? Uh, maybe you ought to start looking for another job. Yeah, you're correct, Khaled. And we're living in an unprecedented era. It's a buzzword, this notion of being unprecedented. Can you provide examples of the unprecedented threats that we are battling in the COVID-19 era? You know, um, you're absolutely right. In 2020, the buzzword became unprecedented. Well, your viewers will, will, be, uh, will be interested to learn that we created the era of the unprecedented investigative program back in 2017. We saw all this coming. I can't tell you that we saw COVID coming, no. But, but the, 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 the unprecedented threats, you could call them unprecedented because of the following criteria. One, scale. Two, impact. Three, motivation. So when you think about cybersecurity, cybersecurity strategies and solutions seldom look at the motivation. They've only started doing this recently so that they can upsell. But they're really a technology that says, well, if you do implement this, this will do that. And then you have to build a thousand solutions together and make sure they're all interoperable. Um, you still need to do this, but... The, the era of the unprecedented was meant to actually uh, uh, showcase how you mitigate these things because existing solutions, we label them as dinosaurs. And if you don't call them as dinosaurs, guess what? Decision makers still think, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, UK is using it, we should use it. 
you know, especially when you're looking at developing market countries. Oh, France is using this, oh, it must be good. America's using it, well, look what happened to America. Third world or developing nations are actually following uh, 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 solutions that are failing to defend or protect nation states and, and, and organizations, that's one. So um, the second, the, the other part here is uh, uh, unprecedented. You need to also create the public awareness mm -hmm. because in a democratic society or uh, where democracy is enshrined by law or constitution, mm -hmm. the citizens meant to be informed. Yeah. Whereas in many parts of the world, democracy is aspired for. Well, guess what? The, the citizen who is either living in a democratic nation or in a, an aspiring democratic nation needs to be better informed so they make sure they call on their leaders to do things differently. And if you don't do things differently, guess what you're gonna get? You're gonna get the same results as of, as of the past. It's really interesting that you mentioned that, you know, this, this is an unprecedented era. And I personally noticed um, there was a war in Armenia, right? And it, yes, um, on the news, like the Western news, it wasn't mentioned. I didn't know until I was talking to someone who lived in Armenia and she was telling me of the war. And I was like, why is this information not circulated on the news, do you know why? Again, dear, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer. You didn't ask the question, but I'm gonna bring this to your attention. If you yeah. go to survivability news, yeah, you will see we were, we don't, we don't cover the Kardashians. Yeah, we don't cover sports. We cover stories that relate to people's lives and livelihoods, and security, and survivability, and geopolitics. Mm -hmm. We were the first to point to the problem going on between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And we called, I think if I remember correctly, the title was uh, 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 Ar Armenia, Ar Ar Azerbaijan uh, war. Uh, the war most Europeans don't know exists on their back door. And why this is relevant. In fact, uh, you might have a breaking story now. Um, we're working on a feature that we will publish very, very soon, which, sort of titled around Armenia lost the war because it lost the geopoly cyber war. Mm -hmm. And these are significant components. So what you're describing here is citizens, especially in democratic nations, are only fed the information or allowed to, or let's say the information is only being put on the airwaves. Um, that seems to be the trend of the day. But how come the Armenia story, Armenia-Azerbaijan, which could have actually escalated into a global uh, war, um, was hardly heard of, not only around the world, but in Europe on the back door. Exactly. And that's a significance. And this is, I mean, this is precisely why we launched Survivability News, to bring conflicting narratives and put in new uh, information so that the citizen is better informed. And only if you're better informed can you have better solutions to your challenges. And that ap applies to COVID as well, which I, I just realized I didn't answer your question on COVID uh, and I'll answer it in a moment, but uh, uh, this, is, this is part of the problem we're facing today. Everybody is busy. One last thing, today citizens have, or people mm -hmm. have the attention span of a fly. Yeah. These are terms I've been using for the last 10 years. And how do you get to their get their attention if all they're watching is TikTok uh, videos that are six seconds long because they want to move to the next six seconds and there's no depth in their knowledge? Well, guess what? If you can't fix that problem, democracy is going to be under unprecedented threats. In fact, we label the democracy is in stage four cancer. Yeah. Because of these problems, because the citizen is uh, poorly informed or misinformed or purposely disinformed yeah and when you said disinformed i i can understand in the covid scenario that a lot of people are misinformed with fake news so can you talk a bit about that oh god this i think would probably require a um an episode <laughs> of its own um <clears throat> if you go and i will call on and feel free to to do the same 
Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the press release that announced the launch of survivability news is definitely worthwhile reading by your by your viewers. Primarily, it goes to the heart as to why we launched survivability news. It is because um, background. I've been involved in the global infrastructure of the internet since the mid to late 90s. Mm-hmm. So I've been involved and would modestly say that I contributed to making it the imperfect multilingual internet it is today. Um, but the dream or the aspiration, the vision was to create a more cohesive society, more tolerant society. Because if you can make local citizens being able to use the internet get information and do it in their own native language, because you re- I don't know if, you, I'm sure you probably know, the internet was structured around the ASCII character set. So many of these languages around the world would not have been able to be typed in their own native languages. So yeah. we had to actually convert or help convert and help stakeholders convert their own language language tables to Punicode so they can work in the URL. And that partially has been successful and that required policy. But, but the key here is the vision was to make a more holistic, more, comp- more, more tolerant society. Because if I can know more about you and I see you with your daughter and I, I can assume you're no different than me and my children. Yeah. The dream actually turned into a nightmare. The nightmare is the state of affairs where the internet and cyber has been utilized to perpetrate not only fake news, uh, uh, disinformation, what we also call purposed disinformation, which is actually a, a cyber warfare vector. When you use purpose disinformation with an agenda, you can literally bring down a nation to its knees within a week. Yeah. And that, by the way, is, is, is where we are today. So unfortunately, the dream ended up being the nightmare that we are today. And when you go to the co- to issue of COVID, you know, um, I consider myself decently informed. You know, I read, I'm, uh, but I've, I've gotten to the point where I have no clue anymore. I cannot be def- definite on whether the COVID uh, uh, pandemic was uh, uh, created by China, created by the US, created by the pharmaceuticals, <clears throat> whether it was a, a, a nature-made or man-made, uh, whether uh, the, the vaccines are um, uh, the solution or, uh, I mean, it, it's absolutely confusing. If I can be this confused and I don't know what's going on, what do you think the average uh, citizen? It is no wonder that now we've become so segregated based on opinions and as, as haunting, as daunting what the scenes we saw at, at the Capitol on the 6th of January, um, uh, these people do believe what they believe. Yeah. And they didn't just wake up one morning and say, oh, we believe this. And that's because, you know, if you keep telling a child, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, guess what? On the, you know, on the seventh day, guess what? They're gonna wake up and think, oh my God, I must be stupid. Uh, or if you tell them you're smart, you're smart, you're smart, they start thinking that they're smart. Unfortunately, this is where we are. And unless we find a means to making the citizen better informed, democracy will die. And this is precisely why we launched Survivability News because they are, the whole concept is to bring content for the reader to see conflicting narratives and conflicting storylines in one place. So they can be better informed and they can be uh, uh, capable to question. Yeah. And when they're able to question, then they can draw their own inference from the information that's provided. I like that, it. You know, that's, that, you know what? This is the premise. The truth of the matter here is I am drawing a lot of information and I cannot tell. Mm-hmm. I've just given it to you, you know. Um, so if I'm in that position, what do you think the average citizen is, 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 is facing? It's a major challenge and it's a challenge for, and here's the, here's the thing, with COVID, um, uh, we've put this out there in the public domain, and I, I talk about this quite often. I say it's it, COVID be- in six months, COVID became the ultimate exposure of the frailty of uh, an injustice of our current uh, world order, our political, economic, uh, and democratic system. Yeah. And it exposed it, what would have taken maybe a generation that might have exposed it. In six months, it exposed this. And now here's the challenge that we're facing. 
the powers that be, those who actually have been the benefactors of this or the perpetrators of this, want to make sure it remains, uh, uh, it's, it stays serving their interest. Yeah. I always said, you know, despite all of the horrid what we, horrors that we've seen, we've seen from COVID, I truly believe we have an opportunity to bring a better world than the one we left behind. Yeah. But this cannot happen unless the citizen is better informed, the citizen is more articulately able to demand from its leadership better things yeah. and hold those politicians more accountable. And if they cannot be accountable, boot them out and bring somebody else. Yeah. This is, this is an opportunity. The truth here is I, the odds are against us succeeding at this, but it doesn't mean you don't fight the good fight. Um, and unfortunately, um, I'm already starting to see the symbolisms of, of labeling tweaks to the system as real change, sold to the people as real change. We've seen it, by the way. And by the way, I cover this in my upcoming book, uh, Survivability. Uh, we talk about uh, uh, the, the, uh, the financial crisis in 2008. Yeah. You know, how, how much did we hear about call for change? radical change you know guess what how much change, how much radical change did we see how much change did we see we only saw tweaks and we back to the same style of operation and that was a uh, a threat to the global community yeah covid is no different so the opportunity is within our hands and it's up to all citizens and uh, uh, believers who believe the same thing to uh, to do something different than uh, and not allow this to happen. Yeah, so if I understand you correctly, you're proposing that the citizen should be more informed, there should be more transparency and accountability of governments to mitigate the threats of this unprecedented era. Am I correct? Uh, you're, you are correct. However, it's an incomplete statement. Okay. There are different layers of threats that society faces. Mm -hmm. so, I can go and create an event, for example, and educate the average user who goes into a Starbucks or a coffee bean or a uh, whatever, a coffee shop, mm -hmm. not to use the open Wi-Fi because it's, it's a threat, it's a risk to their own identity being stolen. But for me to educate 7 billion people on the planet, that's a hard job. Yeah. That's a long job. And guess what? There are numerous examples of this and many still use the same, you know, it also has far more uh, greater uh, uh, impact if you're able to influence top decision makers. Yeah. So when we do our briefings and we compel with our arguments and what we, we can do to decision makers, there's no sales pitching. It becomes more, oh, okay, you're changing mindset. You're making them aware of what was and what's possible now for them to want to explore. And the minute they want to explore, it becomes well, let's look at this, let's look at this, let's look at this. And all of these implementations become consequences. Yeah. They're not, if you can do, if you can help a decision maker to do this, their ability to impact society through what they do in their business or a national leader is far more, uh, much stronger. And today, like I said, governments are in competition. So, um, it is no secret how the, um, uh, I forgot her name, the leader of New Zealand, who is so popular around the world because she genuinely cares. Yeah, definitely. We, her, we don't work with the New Zealand government, but she genuinely cares. And look at many of the policies she put in early, she put in, she didn't need to be told. She, her mindset was already in the right place and she cared. Unfortunately, the breed of politicians that we've inherited do not care about the citizen. They only care about getting the vote. And once they're in power, they serve special interests. That's why virtually all Western democracies, when it came to COVID-19, were very late in dealing with the pandemic. Yeah. You know, we heard about we heard about the 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 uh, the virus out of uh, China, Wuhan for China, in in December and January. Yeah. There are many countries who started putting mitigation protocols back then, including European ones like Greece, by the way. Greece, yeah. Well, how come how come uh, uk oh uh, march april and then they spin failures into you know germany you know we compare the uk compares itself with germany because they have germany have less deaths but they've all failed 
because if they truly cared about the citizen, they would have made the, protecting the citizen first instead of making themselves re-electable. You know, my political uh, speech here. Yeah. Yeah, so speaking about the citizens, how has COVID made survivability real for citizens? This is a very, very good question. Um, most people did not realize the minute COVID happened and the threat of catching it and dying, uh, they all went in survivability mode and depending on their nature. So for example, uh, those who have to work, they have no help from the government. They have to feed their family. Guess what? They knew they were taking the risk to go out there and work because they have no other choice. And many of them paid with, for it with their own lives. Mm -hmm. So prior to COVID, the concept of survivability was predominantly aimed at the top decision makers, governments and, and corporate. Mm -hmm. Since, since uh, COVID, it became even more relevant to the citizen because the citizen is now facing and making decisions based on uh, to secure their own survivability without realizing it is survivability. Yeah. They probably call it survival. Um, if you can't feed your family, what are you going to do next? So that brought the concept of survivability home. And this is predominantly why we decided to launch Survivability News because we wanted to create the awareness at a public level, people to be engaged. And this is why we also have citizen journalism as a component from the reporting that we get in Survivability News. And by the way, which will be in multiple languages. Languages We have another language, Survivability News will be launched uh, imminently. Great. And taking a multi-stakeholder perspective, what's the role of citizens, corporates, businesses, and governments in survivability? I like the question that it's multi-stakeholder, but the truth of the matter here is multi-stakeholder existed long before many of us coined it. Yeah, definitely. The truth of the matter here is I depend on you, you depend on me, we depend on each other. It's always been the case in society until maybe the last 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. We used to exist as a cohesive cohesive members of society. Um, that's why, for example, you see, you see uh, many cultures Part of their strength is the belief that you are you have a role within society, okay? Whereas in the West, because of what I would call laissez-faire economics and, the lay, uh, and then telling the world, you know, uh, uh, go and be the best you can, we've taken, a, uh, and it's about the individual, we've taken away what was a, a, a key component of our human nature, which is to feel like we are a member of a society and we made it into, it's about me. So that's why there are a lot of people who don't, what do I care? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be a bit, you know, let me ask you this question. 25 years ago, if a man operated prostitutes, he would have been called a pimp. Today, if you operate porn sites and you get awards, you're a businessman, you're an entrepreneur. So the values have shifted. So the role of citizens, and by the way, I'm not passing judgment on anybody. I'm just using an example. This is how we've shifted. So today, the role of citizen is more critical than ever, especially if you live in a democratic society, because if you don't call out your politicians who are not serving you and, the, and, and society, Guess what? You deserve what you get. It's as simple as this. Yeah, that's so true. And Khaled, what's your message to our audience? Aside from all the messages I've given you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think I, uh, no, it's, it's, it's a very good question because let's capsulate this. We do, we now have proven that we live in unprecedented times mm -hmm. and these unprecedented times don't just affect governments, businesses, and what's it to do with me? I still have to go to work. If you look at, sorry, for example, sectors within society, look at the hospitality sector, for example, mm -hmm. and look at it, the way it's been impacted from COVID. COVID has done its damage to the hospitality sector, understood. Yeah. But governments come in and now the only, know, the only way how governments know how to deal with a problem is what they've known how to deal with a problem. So it is no surprise 
that governments are using what we call the paintbrush approach. So some of them are using three tiers, some of them use four tiers, some of them use, guess what? The only, first they were late in responding and then they have to show that they are responding. So they lock the whole country down and then they tell how stakeholders need to operate within their own sector, which majority of them do a fantastic job and mitigate being spreaders, that's the key. But then when the government needs to shut down, they shut down everything. So this is costing not only the economy, it's costing people's lives and livelihoods. And that's because poor decisions. And recently we announced our gift to the world. We offered, we, you know, people who will go to, you can point them to it. Um, the, uh, we call it the, uh, we launched the uh, MLI Group Sector Survivability Series and we started with hospitality. And it's a templated model how a nation, a government could start exploring how a particular model can allow its stakeholders within hospitality to actually open up safely and instead of being a drain on it, the nation's resources to, to keep these people locked and pay them so that they can feed themselves, they can start contributing to the, the rebooting of the economy, but doing it safely. Um, these are some of the examples. And unfortunately, you know, like I said, there are 7 billion people out there today. Um, can you, can you and compel everybody to, to follow? Of course not. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the role of the citizen is exceptionally important in calling on the governments to say, why don't you consider this? Why aren't you doing this? Why don't you do that? Um, and it's not an easy one. One last point, you don't need to have all the population mesmerized with what needs to be done. What you need to do is to have smart, articulate, capable people to start putting this out there for people to become aware. And you can't do anything if you don't know what's possible. Yeah. So part of what we're doing is putting this out there so people become aware that these things are possible. It is possible to open hospitality and open safely based on the different stakeholder groups within it and follow a guideline that is medical and scientific and doing it safely. It is possible, but you need to have the decision makers to do this. And if the, if the citizen doesn't say, why don't we consider this? So it's premised on the stakeholders who have a stake in this to actually push this and tell their, their governments, why don't you consider this? Yeah. So, yeah. Definitely. And how can people reach you, Khaled? Well, I'm not that easily reachable, by the way. <laughs> if you go to survivability.news, um, you'll be able to reach the information. You'll be able to uh, go to contact us and send messages. We are we are eager to collaborate with like-minded thinkers and organizations. And um, we are open to exploring with those who are compelled who we'll be talking about to see how we can fit to the way they operate. <clears throat> no two countries have the same modality. Yeah. Some of them are more advanced, some of them are less advanced. You have to understand, we, ha we have to figure out what do you have in place? So at least what do you need to focus on as a priority? So that, you know, so um, if they go to survivability news, this is one simple way. And uh, those who reach out to you, uh, genuine interest, um, I'll share with you my details and you please feel free to uh, forward them directly to me to get my direct attention. I'm happy to, to look at those as well. Thank you so much. Khaled, thank you for sharing your extensive knowledge on survivability, how to mitigate the threats, of this unprecedented era, we were really enlightened. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure and uh, great work on your side. And let's see what we can do with all this. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in on Experts Connect. Please head on over to teachsomebody.com and give us an applause. You may share your comments and ask your questions in the comment section. Please subscribe to us on YouTube, as well as follow us on Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts. You can also follow me on Instagram at Kadian Davis Owusu. Have a lovely rest of the week. Bye.